For this video, we're going to go back in time, back to the mid 1950s. And uh, I'm actually at Leiston Airfield, which is now closed, been closed a long time ago. But in actual fact, it was closed approximately 1955 by the RAF. And that's the time that I want to go back to with this video about a particular antenna. But just a little bit about Leiston Airfield, particularly interesting to those uh, from the USA. Leiston Airfield was completed in 1943, the year I was born actually. And it was occupied by the fighter groups, 357 and 358 fighter groups. And it was occupied for a period of about two, two and a half years. Originally, it was designed to be a bomber base, and that's how it was constructed, because it had very long runways. But for whatever reason, the uh, Americans decided that they would use it as a fighter base, and it became a fighter base for the very famous Mustang fighter. P-51, I think it was. Anyway, the Mustang fighter. And if you go on the internet, you'll find some history about Leiston Airfield. Today, it's returned primarily to farmland and also to a holiday park. And I've got a small place on this holiday park. And it's, uh, it's quite interesting, actually, to sort of see the, the remains. Not that there are many remains. This is one of the remaining buildings that was used during the Second World War and would have been occupied by American servicemen for whatever reason, maintenance or whatever, storage, who knows. Most of the buildings have now disappeared. There is um, a small museum, which I should put up on the screen now. This museum is open occasionally, but if you want to have a look around, you just go to the gate and uh, they'll let you have the keys to look at it. It's got some interesting memorabilia of Leyston Airfield when it was occupied by the American forces. Lots of photographs and some interesting stories. And then we've got the memorial, which is visited annually um, by representatives of the American forces and those that look after the memorial itself. So I'm going to talk about an antenna which I have spoken about before, but it's a very interesting antenna designed by G4ZU. Yes, I've covered it, covered it before, but I've now got some more information which I think will interest you. Hello. And uh, if you're not interested in aircraft, you probably skipped the opening bit. This really is about a mini beam. And uh, as I said in the uh, intro there, I covered this antenna uh, in a video about a year ago now. But what I want to do now is to go through this antenna in a bit more detail because I've got some information which I had missing at the time. I've now got the measurements of the antenna and uh, some, uh, some other bits and pieces of uh, uh, information. Basically, um, the G4ZU mini beam was conceived in the mid 50s and it was a very famous antenna. It was a very popular antenna because it covered the three popular HF bands 20 meters, 15 meters, and 10 meters. And it used uh, sections of 12 foot lengths of aluminium. I think at that time, 12 foot lengths of aluminium were readily available. And so the whole antenna. Uh, depended on the fact that you could get 12 foot lengths of uh, aluminium. Basically, as I say, it covers three bands, but it's it's uh, it's not half size. Um, on 20 meters, it's about two thirds the size of a full size antenna, but it is a tri-band antenna and it does perform particularly well. On 20 meters, you get a forward gain of around about three, three and a half dB. On 15 and 10, you get a forward gain of about five dB. And the front to back tends to be around about 15 dB. So it's quite a good performer for its size. What I'm going to do now is to take you through the design of this antenna, because I think as we go through the design of this antenna, it will give you some ideas that you may be able to incorporate in perhaps your own uh, little uh, mini beam for your back garden. Let's first take a look at the driven element. 
Now the driven element is effectively a doublet and one of the advantages of a doublet is that it will cover a wide range of frequencies. The element or the driven element is basically a half wave on the 15 meter or the 21 megahertz band. But because it's a doublet and because it's fed with 450 ohm ladder line it does mean to say that it can accept power over quite a wide frequency range. In this particular case G4ZU proved that it will accept power between 14 megahertz and 30 megahertz and of course now we have the walk bands so it means to say that this driven element not only covers the 10, 15 and 20 meter bands but it also covers the 17 and 12 meter bands, it covers 5 bands. Now you may be wondering what about 450 ohm ladder line because if it's a Yagi, if we're going to make a Yagi, it's going to be rotatable. How do we get around rotating antenna with 450 ohm ladder line? Because that ladder line is going to be near some metal work, particularly where the rotator is and perhaps a stub mast. Well, I've found that ladder line is not nearly so sensitive to metal work as you may think. It can be placed quite close to metal work without unbalancing it. And I would venture to suggest that probably it's not at all affected by being placed near a rotator. I guess G4ZU found the same because he used balanced line. Now the good thing about this design is that you could actually start off with a rotatable dipole and a rotatable dipole is quite good. So this rotatable dipole has got a particular advantage. It can be fed with power on any frequency between approximately 14 megahertz and 30 megahertz. That makes it a very flexible dipole and you could actually erect such a dipole and put it onto a rotator and you'd have a, a rotatable dipole that had got some reasonable amount of directivity. So that's where we start from on this antenna. It's a very flexible dipole. Now I should add by the way that I've mentioned 450 ohm ladder line um, G4ZU mentions open wire feeder and 450 ohm ladder line is probably pretty close to uh, uh, open wire feeder. He also mentions that the feeder length should be between 38 and 40 foot and I guess he's worked out that that is a reasonable um, matching point in order to avoid any sort of high voltage points and make it easier to feed the antenna. But of course, if you're going to use this antenna on other bands other than 10, 15 and 20, um, you may find that uh, that is not the optimum. But really and truly, uh, with ladder line, it's not too difficult to get a match. And I've always found that um, if uh, you've got a particular problem, just make it a bit longer, a bit shorter, and you usually source out all the problems. So how are we going to connect the 450 ohm ladder line to our transceiver? Well, there's two options. It may be that your internal ATU in your transceiver has got wide enough capability to simply connect a one-to-one -one or four-to-one ballon on the output of your transceiver and attach the 450 ohm ladder line to it. I know that my uh, Yaesu FT710 it's got a very wide range in ATU and I can match 450 ohm ladder line that way. But if your ATU won't cope then you will need uh, an external antenna tuning unit. Now a lot of antenna tuning units have a connection for balance line anyway so you simply have an external ATU and you connect your balance line to that. And if it's an auto ATU which it may well be um, it's very rapid indeed. The alternative, of course, is to actually have a short coax line going from the shack to the outside world and then have a one-to-one -one or four-to-one ballon connected to it with the ladder line connected there. That's an alternative way of doing it. That works quite well. So let's now try adding a director. We've got the driven element down there and we're going to have a five foot boom up there and above my head we can have a director. There we are, 
director. Now, ignore the coil in the middle at the moment. Imagine that director as being one continual tube or rod, which is resonant just above the uh, 30 megahertz band. And we'll come back to the resonances a bit later on. So you've got a director now. That means to say we have gain on the 10 meter band. We've now got an antenna which is five bands and it's got a bit of gain on 10 meters. In fact, the gain is, a, is roughly five dB. Get the idea. So let's now take a look at the coil that appears in the middle of the director. We'll home in on that now. I'll put the dimensions of the coil at uh, one side of this video so you can see the dimensions. What this coil does, it resonates the director onto the 15 meter band. We've got a 15 meter director now with that coil in place. Well, that's fine, isn't it? But if we've got a 15 meter director now, which is loaded in the center with this coil, where does that leave the 10 meter element, which we've ostensibly lost? Well, we haven't actually lost it because what G4ZU did was to put a quarter wave stub across that coil. Now, a quarter wave stub has the function of short circuiting the coil when it's resonant on the 10 meter band. So what we do is we make that stub resonant on the 10 meter band. Now, a quarter wave stub is what uh, the description says it is. It's a quarter wave long, although you have to uh, allow for velocity factor. And the original stub was made of 72 ohm balance line, I think. I see no reason why you can't use coax as a stub or perhaps a bit of 300 ohm ribbon. And when that quarter wave stub is open at the far end, it acts as a switch when it sees energy on its resonant frequency. In this case, we're talking about a quarter wave stub, which is resonant at 10 meters. And therefore at 10 meters, it shorts out, so it shorts out the coil. On 15 meters, it has no effect at all. A little bit of capacity loading, but no effect at all, really. So we've now got a director element, which is dual band. So we've now effectively got a two element Yagi, which has five band capability. Okay, on some of the bands, it's just a dipole, but on 15 and 10 meters, we've got forward gain around about five dB on a fairly compact antenna with boom just five feet long. Still a very compact antenna. So now we're gonna add reflector. The driven element is up there and the reflector is down there. And we've increased the boom length to 12 feet. We've already got five feet between the driven element and the director. We're gonna have seven feet between the driven element and reflector. And we're gonna use the same principle as before. The director on its own is resonant just below the 21 megahertz band. We're going to insert a coil and I'll show you the details of that to one side of this video. And that coil will actually bring the antenna to resonance or the reflector to resonance on 20 meters. And we will have a quarter wave switch across the coil. This time the quarter wave switch will be resonant on the 21 uh, megahertz band. So in fact, this mini beam gives you a lot of different options. You've got the dipole element, which will resonate on any band from 14 to uh, 30 megahertz. You could add a director for 10 meters without the coil, just have the director. You could have a reflector for 15 meters again without the coil. So you'd have an antenna, which is two elements on 10, two elements on 15, and the dipole works on all the other bands.
But anyway, going back to the original design that G4ZU conceived with these coils in place. On 10 meters, we appear to have just two elements. We've got a, two, a 10 meter director, and of course the dipole will cover anything between 14 megahertz and 30 megahertz. So it's a two element on 10 meters. We've got three elements on 15 meters because we've got a director that can be resonated on 15 meters and we've got a reflector that can resonate on 15 meters. On 20 meters we've only got two elements because we've got the uh, main dipole which of course resonates anywhere and we've got a reflector which resonates on 20 meters. So we seem to be a bit short on 10 meters. Well interestingly enough a G4 ZU explained that that reflector that's resonant on 20 meters is also a full wavelength on 10 meters. So it acts as a reflector on 10 meters. So in effect, you've got three elements on 10 meters. Now, G4 ZU claimed that that reflector gave the effect of two elements on 10 meters. I'm not quite sure about that. But anyway, it does appear that that, that uh, reflector Although it's resonant on 20 meters and 15 meters, it's also a full wavelength on 10 meters, so it does act as a reflector on 10 meters and gives you three elements on 10 meters. So, in summary, you've got three elements on 10 meters, you've got three elements on 15 meters, and you've got two elements on 20 meters. So, I hope that's given you some interesting ideas on how perhaps you can make a compact antenna and as I said right at the beginning even just using the dipole um, is a good idea because it will resonate on any band from 40 megahertz to uh, 30 megahertz or I say resonate it can be matched on any of those bands and that in itself is quite a, a nice idea so thank you for watching this video by the way at Waters and Stanton we have a wide range of products we're very busy now on sending out goods all over the place now all over the world in fact and uh, we are known for not only for the all the mainline products that we sell but also all the accessories we sell we've got loads and loads of accessories so do check our website for the latest accessories and the summary of these videos is also presented as a blog so i think it's the top left hand corner of our website you'll see the blog there so Take a look at that as well. And uh, don't forget, if you've got any particular item you're looking for, you're not quite sure, you can always give us a ring and we'll be more than happy to help you out. In the meantime, thank you for your support on this channel. Don't forget to press the subscribe button. It just indicates to us how many people are actually following this channel. No more than that. In the meantime, you enjoy your home radio, you take care. And as usual, I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye for now.